Well, thank you everyone for coming today. I'm overwhelmed by the number of people here, I'm going to be honest, um, and by the, the sort of uh, caliber of everyone who's here, I'm very nervous. Um, but I want to have a special thanks to Mark, to Pavon, Olivier, Alex, Nick, and to Mary for making everything possible today um, for me to be here and the generosity of the Powers Institute, uh, the Art Gallery, New South Wales, as well as the University of Sydney for allowing for me to be here. It's a real honor for me to be here, to be following in the footsteps of uh, Dr. Singh, um, who started off, I believe, this academic year's uh, Sydney Powers Institute seminar series. Um, so I, um, I hope that in the coming weeks, months, and years that we continue to honor and cherish her memories and her seminal work in Mughal painting and South Asian museum studies. Um, what I have said to uh, Olivier and Nick a few times is that when I was initially invited, I really did think it was some sort of phishing scam. Um, it sounded just too good to be true. Uh, so when I finally got on a Zoom with them, I finally, I realized that they were not, you know, some strangers in some far flung place trying to get cash from me. And so once I realized that this was like a real opportunity, I jumped on the chance. Um, one, because I have never been to Sydney or Australia, but two, I have long admired the work of many of the professors here at the university. And in particular, I have gotten a chance to meet one of my academic heroes, Professor Clark, who is sitting here at this table. So I am very um, honored to be here. But today I wanted to talk about smart history. So when Olivier, Alex and Nick and I sat down to think about what I could present on in this workshop, I had initially thought about presenting on my current research project on the traveling exhibition, The Arts of Thailand that traveled through the United States and parts of Europe. But then I thought, well, you know, I'd really like to have a more collaborative project that I can present and something possibly that uh, we can work on together. And so I thought smart history would be um, something that I wanted to present to you all today. And I'm sure that some of you are familiar with smart history, maybe some of you are not. And so I hope this will pique your interest. Um, a little bit about smart history. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, I, uh, I hope this is interesting to you, but for those of you who are familiar, who perhaps um, assigned some of the readings to your students, I hope that I'm giving a, a sort of behind the scenes uh, view of smart history and how content is sourced and also produced. So a little history about smart history itself. So what is smart history? Smart history is the largest digital platform for the study of art history in the world. And so that may sound like a very big um, claim, but it is quite true. Uh, it has, since 2020, when the world shut down because of the COVID pandemic, you can imagine that its uh, viewership and the people who access it has grown in number. So in fact, since 2020, it has consistently had over 50 million users year over year since 2020. So that's pretty astounding. So what that gives you a sense of is that it has a very large platform, but it's also very global. So um, visitors come from almost every nation on earth that accesses this material. Smart history itself began in 2005. So um, it's actually been around for quite some time and it was founded by two art historians, Dr. Stephen Zucker and Beth Harris. At the time, Stephen Zucker was a professor at Pratt Institute in New York City, and Beth was a digital content, or the director of digital content at the Met Museum. And so they had started producing on the side videos and blogs for their students because they were both teaching online. So in fact, they were teaching online before most of us have. I never taught online until the pandemic. 2020 was the first time I had ever taught online, but they were doing this in the early 2000s. And so they wanted to provide a different type of art history, a type of art history that was um, without jargon, that was more approachable and digestible to a broader audience. They actually started off with videos, um, videos that would, you had the same 
was covering the same material as the Met, but it was being presented in a different way. Most of their videos and essays lived on a free WordPress blog, but in 2015, they merged with the Khan Academy. So the Khan Academy might be a platform that you are familiar with, but you, like me, probably think about it in terms of it really providing um, you know, education based on STEM, so the sciences in other words. But in 2015, because of funding that was coming into the Khan Academy, because Khan Academy wanted to reach out to the humanities as well, they started working with uh, educators and other folks who had an online presence in the humanities. And that's when smart history became merged with the Khan Academy. Um, now that was quite short lived. It was actually for less than a year. After a year with the Khan Academy, uh, Beth and Steven parted ways and began smart history on their own platform. That being said, so just give you a sense of where art history lives in there. Uh, that being said, all of the content that you can find on Smart History also lives on the Khan Academy website. And the reason for that is because um, the folks that visit the Khan Academy might not automatically go to Smart History. So they want to have that information living in two different places. However, what I started off by saying was that Khan Academy, or sorry, that Smart History has 50 million. Um, users and viewers every year that is specific to art history. That does not include the people who access smart history content from the Khan Academy. Okay. So when you go to the Khan Academy, you will see all of the same essays and videos that live on smart history. Um, however, they live in the Khan Academy and they are presented in the way that Khan Academy likes to present their material. So it's, it's not as um, visually centered as what you will find on smart history, for example. So just um, out of my curiosity, how many of you use smart history in your classes or have accessed smart history before? Okay, not very many. Okay, so this is good. I'm really glad that I'm presenting on this today, but... Um, in 2015, when they parted ways with the Khan Academy, they started their own standalone standalone website, which you can see. And it has grown enormously since then. Um, to date, there are over 3,000 essays and over 1,000 videos. And these are all open educational resources, which means that it is free. Um, it, you will never be charged for it. There will never be a paywall. And in fact, uh, because they are such a prominent platform now and because they have produced so many books, Publishers have actually uh, asked to work alongside them, and every single time they have um, rejected any sort of partnership with book publishers because the idea is that they always want to make their materials available for free. So, you know, partnering with a, a traditional book publisher would uh, negate that. So, what you can see here, so I apologize that I am essentially. I'm showing you screenshots of the website, but I thought this would probably the, be the best way to do it. You can see that there is a wide range of art historical periods and topics that are made available. Now, not all of these periods and regions are evenly covered, and that is because much of the content is written by volunteer scholars. Um, to date, there are over 600 art historians archaeologists and museum curators who write for smart history. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a moment, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what lives on the site. Um, if you were to click on any one of these items, it would take you to another section of the platform where you would be um, exposed to all of their other content as it relates to example for Arts of Africa. Um, you'll notice here that it's specific to the US, I believe. Um, there are specialized courses for secondary students to take in art history. Once they take those courses, those credits can be applied um, to the university. I'm not sure if that's uh, the same here in Australia. Um, there is a, uh, a landing page that they would love students to begin with. 
Um, and I think this is a really great resource for us, particularly when we're teaching at the undergraduate level, perhaps in year one and year two. But this is a way to introduce students in, um, you know, how to look at art, different approaches to art history, um, thinking about art from a beginner's perspective, but also thinking about the importance of museums in the study of art history as well. So there are essays and content available there. And this is in addition to all of their content essays focused on specific objects and monuments as they relate to specific periods and regions of art. Let me take you here. From the very beginning, smart history began with the goal of providing an alternative to the traditional textbook. And so what I'm showing you here are two of the major textbooks that we typically use in art history um, in the United States. So there's Art Through the Ages. And in fact, uh, Fred Kleiner was my professor at Boston University. So I uh, used this book. I Probably it was like the 10th edition or something. Now we're in the 16th edition. Um, what you're seeing here is the uh, rather new, it came out just a few months ago, The History of Asian Art, a Global Perspective, produced by Thames and Hudson. And so for Beth and Stephen, they've always wanted art history to provide an alternative to the textbook. And I think all of us can agree that there are limitations to the traditional art history text. First and foremost, it's limited by the nature of its format, right? It's bound. So, um, you know, there's only so much information that can live within the pages of the book. And also necessarily the information has to begin and end at a certain place and time. And so you can't have everything within this bound format. Not only that, but the content of the traditional textbook is also limited by the editors and the authors of the text as well. Um, as many of you know, having taught your own classes or uh, been enrolled in art history classes, there are some regions or some topics or periods of art that are more better covered than others. And that has a lot to do with the editors or the authors that are tasked with writing such textbooks. Um, the third limitation of the traditional textbook is the publication of these textbooks, right? The cost of getting image rights, the types of images that you can actually get in terms of photography into the textbook. So all of this leads to textbooks that um, are limited in scope but also can be very expensive. So having a digital textbook, not just an ebook, but a digital textbook on smart history, um, I believe is a, a major game changer. And so um, what I can say from my experience in uh, you know, teaching Asian art, uh, that I have not found a one particular textbook that really allows me to teach a course. Um, so this is the newest uh, survey of Asian art that has just come out. This book has just been published last year. Um, while I was a consultant for the book, I was a content reviewer. Um, I was very disappointed by the lack of Southeast Asia content in the textbook itself. If you notice, the textbook is written by two specialists, one who is a specialist of South Asian material and the other who is a specialist of Chinese art. And so, you know, for me as someone who focuses on the region of Southeast Asia, I see this as a perpetuation of the marginalization of the study of Southeast Asian art and the uh, preference for South and particular East Asian art and that being China. When I voiced my concerns to the publisher, um, they said that they understood where I was coming from, but this was how the book would be presented. And um, what you're seeing here is just one page of the table of contents. And so what I had voiced as my concern was that while you know China and Japan and India had multiple chapters dedicated to them, the whole region of Southeast Asia did not have a single chapter. Instead, Southeast Asian content was distributed throughout the text, right, in thematic chapters like Hinduism or Buddhist art or monumental architecture. And so, you know, if, if this is the newest form of an Asian art history survey, that is very limiting. So that's also one of the reasons why I am interested in working with smart history as an alternative. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, 
the art that is presented in um, the history of Asian art textbook, when it is related to Southeast Asia, is exactly what you would expect, right? It's a sort of canonical monuments that we have studied over and over again since the 19th century. So it's monuments like Orbador and in Indonesia and Angkor Wat um, from Siem Reap, Cambodia. So in some ways, it's reinforcing these canons that were established in the 19th century when much of the region was colonized. And so I see my work with smart history not only as a way to um, expand what is presented in terms of Southeast Asian material and making it available to students for free, but also as a form of decolonizing the study of Southeast Asian art history. Um, and I do that in, you know, not only the types of essays that we're hoping to publish on smart history, but also the sort of scholars that I am trying to get to write for smart history as well. So I'm specifically looking for um, younger scholars from the region who have a, a, a regional perspective. Um, in terms of really thinking about smart history as an alternative to the traditional art history textbook, I wanted to introduce you to some of the art history textbooks that smart history has already produced. So these are two of just um, a little short of a dozen. Uh, there's Reframing Art History, which I'm going to focus on today. They've also produced a, a textbook on Byzantian art. But you can see here, oh, sorry, here, there are other um, types of art history textbooks that they have produced. They've produced one on ancient Roman art and also one on Greek art, and then um, also guides to the AP exam, um, which is the secondary um, art history, uh, stu or the study of art history in um, secondary education. But one of the reasons why um, the smart history textbooks are so appealing, right, for me as an instructor, is that it's not limited, right? Again, you know, I started off by talking about the limitations of the traditional textbook. It's not limited by those confines, but also because of the cost. You know, um, that's one of the prohibitive things for students. And if you, the University of Sydney is anything like my university and many of the universities in the US, um, we're trying to make higher education um, more diverse. So that could be through the process of admissions, uh, scholarships, but one way in which faculty can diversify the type of students who take our classes is try to get rid of the financial barriers of taking our classes, which is to try to use OER or open educational resources rather than having our students purchase textbooks. So um, textbooks typically cost in anywhere from 100 and upwards of 200 to $300 per text. So for example, a student taking three to four courses at my university can spend anywhere from five to $600 on top of our very expensive tuition, on top of their parents who are trying to convince them to do something more practical mm -hmm. and more business-minded. Um, so if they can tell their parents, you know, you don't have this added cost. Uh, I can only speak to my university, but I believe tuition without room and board is already at $50,000 US, right? That is quite exorbitant. But you might be asking yourself, well, what's another $500 if you're already spending that much? <laughs> um, but this is a, a cost savings, um, which we are happy to be able to do for our students. So for example, if you were to um, be teaching Greek art and archeology, span which one of my colleagues does, um, she has traditionally used this book by Professor uh, Nier, but has recently switched over to the Smart History uh, Guide to Ancient Greek Art. And so she is able to supplement her students' readings, not only with this, but also articles from um, JSTOR, for example, or um, from other OER resources. And what you can see here is that, you know, students can download the entire book in PDF format directly from the website, or if they wanna have something that is bound, they can order a bound book as well, 
right? So that is an opportunity. And again, you know, obviously you're going to have to pay for the bound book to be produced, but um, these books that are produced by Smart History are never for sale. They're always distributed for fee and free and made available to anyone who has access to the internet. And again, I should reiterate if I haven't made it clear already that um, Smart History is accessed by uh, people from literally almost every nation on earth. So it has a very global, um, global usership. That being said, everything is written in English. Um, so that is, you know, a perennial uh, problem. I wanna focus today on reframing art history. Um, this is the biggest project to date that smart history is undertaking. This is conceived as a, uh, a rethinking of the teaching of art history and really as an alternative to the traditional textbook. Um, so to date, Reframing Art History has been compiled or all of the content has been written by over 50 different uh, art historians, archeologists, and museum curators. To date, there are 79 chapters, which may seem like a lot, but again, right, this is a text that is not bound by traditional formats. You know, you can assign an ebook to your student, but the ebook is essentially a digital version of a bound book with some live links. Uh, the smart history texts can grow vertically and horizontally. So the beauty of these texts is that essentially it is a textbook within a textbook. So I'll show you how that is possible. At present, reframing art history is divided into six different parts that is organized um, chronologically. Okay, so there had to be some sort of organizing mechanism when you are presenting the world's art history um, in this format. So what I'm showing you is, are just a couple of the different parts. So you have the introduction to art history where you're learning about major concepts, for example. I'm just showing you very short snippets of it. There's actually much more content to each section, but I only captured a very small portion of each part of the text. Um, you can see, oh, I'm wondering if we can get rid of this cookie bar on top. Um, you may have to, yeah, if you- Do I click on that? While you're sharing it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, if you go to the- if you go to the down the bottom there, there's a little, Here? Um, yeah, if there's a little minimize bar, you might be able to minimize it. Or oh, I think that just minimizes, oh, yeah. minimizes this. Okay. okay. Well, you'll have to trust me when I tell you that this is part two yeah. of the textbook and it covers, um, you know, prehistoric material up to the third century CE. And so again, it really moves chronologically, but it presents the world to students in a way that is very global. Right, so you have arts from China, for example, from South America, from Egypt, and from the Aegean being presented during this time period. So it's a it's a very global presentation of art history rather than presenting it both chronologically and geographically as well. So it's a way for students to see what's happening in the world during this particular time period. Um, and, and it moves all the way through contemporary art as well. Okay, so it's from prehistoric to contemporary. And again, um, content continues to be built. So this is just the beginning. It is not the end. It will continue to grow. But I want to focus on just one aspect because I want you guys to get a sense of how the smart history text grows both vertically and horizontally and how it can exist as a textbook within a textbook. So for example, if we just focus on this chapter in part two on the world of ancient Egypt, right? If you click on that, it will take you to this chapter, this thematic chapter that introduces you to the world of ancient Egypt. From there, you will be introduced to one of the hundreds of essays that are related to Egypt that lives on smart history. So in this way, right? It really is a textbook within a textbook. And so after you read this chapter on the world of ancient Egypt, if you continue scrolling down, right, there's different um, sections of the, the chapter. This particular uh, section of the chapter focuses on historical setting. So you can see that within this 
portion of the chapter, it links you to other essays that live on Smart History's website that um, covers content as it relates to historical setting in Egyptian art. So if we then click on one of those essays, right, um, in particular, the Middle Kingdom, right, then you will be taken to another essay that will introduce students to specifically art of the Middle Kingdom period. And from there, you'll be taken to specific monuments and objects as they relate specifically to the Middle Kingdom. What's also nice as well, as you can see, um, that you have specific essays that students can work through so they can complete right, a specific number of readings to feel like they've completed an assignment. Now, there is a way on the back end for you as an instructor to assign specific texts and to make sure that your students have actually read all of those texts so you can see it. In the same way that your, um, your course websites, the ones that you probably use, um, can do as well. So you can do that through Smart History. Um, it takes a little bit of finagling and figuring out, but you can do that as well. So your question might be, well, who writes for smart history, right? Who puts together all this content? It is mostly free labor. Um, it is like-minded folks like you and me who really care about the study of art history, um, who want to make the study of art history more known and more accessible. And so, again, as I have mentioned, to date, there are over 600 contributors. So these include... Um, both advanced graduate students, but also scholars and museum curators and working archaeologists. What I'm showing you is just a snapshot of some of the contributors. So I literally just took the first few uh, at the beginning of the alphabet and the first few at the end of the alphabet. But you can see that it's um, also contributes from specific institutions as well. So for example, the MAP Academy um, also contributes to smart history. Again, the majority of the content is written by volunteers. So what this means is that the content that you may have already accessed, right, was written for free. Some contributors, contributors have written just one essay. Um, others have produced enough content to produce an entire textbook. So it really is dependent on the energy of the individual and their willingness to invest time and effort into this. Um, and that might explain why if you've accessed smart history content, there are some periods and areas of art history that feel very full and others that feel very sparse. And again, that's because it's very much on a volunteer basis. Um, this is just some of the content that I've helped to produce for smart history. What I can tell you is that because this is mostly a volunteer position, right, I was personally discouraged um, to write for smart history while I was going through the tenure review process. Because at my university, writing for platforms like this does not count, right? As far as scholarship, it doesn't count as far as service. And so it really did not incentivize me to produce any sort of content at all. So what I wrote or what I've written was uh, during the years when I was a museum curator or after I received tenure. Um, now, that being said, now that I'm chair of my department, I have changed the tenure review guidelines of my department um, so that smart writing for platforms like Smart History does count towards tenure. Now, it's not going to count towards producing, um, you know, scholarly articles or essays or a book, but it does count towards service, for example. So it does incentivize um, folks to write for platforms like Smart History. And this is because you know, I find my work to, for Smart History Bree to be um, very satisfying. I don't know if this is the next slide, but I'll get there in a second. But um, in terms of what I've written thus far, uh, what I've written is to populate the subject subjects that I teach in my classes, but I haven't been able to find appropriate readings for my students. Either the readings that exist are too scholarly or they're um, not general enough for my undergraduate students. Um, I've also specifically written essays that are covered in the AP art curriculum. And so I'm highlighting those um, essays here. 
So these are objects or monuments that are part of the advanced placement tests in the AP curriculum in the US. So again, these are for secondary students who are trying to get college credit. Um, and the reason why Smart History has focused on AP curriculum is because it's this belief that if we can get secondary students interested in the study of art history early on, then they will major in art history once they go to university. So we have a, a larger number of art history majors. I don't know if this is happening here at the University of Sydney, but what I can say at my university and others in the US is that the number of art history majors has declined um, significantly, particularly after the, the last major financial crisis in 2008. We're starting to rebuild our numbers, but they have never gone back to those numbers in 2008. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that, but I know from speaking to many of my students that the cost of tuition is just so exorbitant now that to justify going into art history and coming out with a degree that may not cover their tuition is really hard for both them and their parents to justify. Okay. Oh, so <laughs> I brought these in because... I wanted to show you um, how I've been pleasantly surprised by who actually reads my essays on smart history. So, uh, you know, when I write for uh, journals or my, you know, academic work, I'm pretty sure that maybe three, five, if I'm lucky, seven people have read those things and they're usually a highly engaged, highly uh, educated audience. But my audience for my smart history essays are very broad, right? They include um, students, my own, because I assign them. They include students of my colleagues, because I know my colleagues assign my essays. They include high school students, because these students come to my classes and tell me that they've read my material. So I feel kind of like a rock star, right, when they've already come. But because I live in Los Angeles and the industry is Hollywood, um, I have people in Hollywood who approach me because they have found my work through smart history, uh, because people in the industry do things like they just Google, right? They're like Southeast Asian art. And then smart history comes up because it is the biggest platform as it relates to Southeast Asian art. So these are just some of the um, projects that I have been asked to work on. I haven't worked on all of them, um, just to give you a sense of the, the, the sort of weirdness. Um, so I've continually said no to ancient aliens, you guys. I don't know if you know what that program is, um, but I've said no to them several times. So the premise is that, um, you know, some of the world's greatest ancient monuments was not actually produced by humans, but in fact by aliens. And so I've always said no. Um, <laughs> but I have to say that when I tell my students this, um, they're always delighted and it gives them a sense of, you know, what art history can be and what they can do with their degree, right? It's more than just being a professor because they're not really interested, I have to say. Um, although being a museum curator is very enticing and glamorous to them, uh, the idea of going to get a PhD is not. So um, all joking aside, right, uh, my work with Smart History does also introduce my work to other scholars outside of my field. So for example, I was recently approached by two specialists of Renaissance art who uh, became familiar with my work through Smart History. So I'm contributing to this, um, this text that is coming out uh, very soon on the global Renaissance. Um, so, you know, for those of you who are working on your graduate degrees, right, in art history, I think this is a great platform for you to start writing, um, having your writing known and your names known as well. And I say this because I know that Professor Lowe is teaching a class on writing for museums and these sorts of platforms this semester. So uh, hopefully, uh, if, if you're interested, uh, get in contact with me. All right. So I want to return to Southeast Asia. If you go to the Southeast Asia landing page, it is very sad looking, right? 
there is hardly any content. And for those of you who are familiar with the region of Southeast Asia, you know that there are more countries than this in Southeast Asia, right? And so part of the reason why there is so little Southeast Asia content is the blame can be put partially on me because I am the content editor. And so as I had mentioned, um, I, I recently received tenure um, and when I received tenure, I also got the gift of becoming chair of my department. Um, so that was my prize, which I did not want, <laughs> but it was my prize. But now that I have more time to focus on smart history, I'm trying to build up the content um, on smart history. So far, I have uh, three folks that write with me um, on a consistent basis. Um, so we have a specialist on board right now who works on Indonesia, we have a specialist uh, in Vietnam, and we have two specialists who work on Thailand that are trying to build up the content. Now, this content is limited for a number of reasons, not only because it's my fault that I haven't reached out to folks, but because again, you know, when you're asking people to write for free and in English, that really limits who you can ask and who is willing to work with you, which is not very many people. I've asked a lot of people and a lot of people will say, I'd love to help, but I'm really busy right now. Um, I'll get back to you. Uh, so part of this workshop is me hoping that I could, can, could uh, get some of your help to start populating uh, Southeast Asia as well. So if you know anyone who might be interested in writing for Southeast Asia, please have them contact me. Um, so again, the content is very sparse at the moment. Um, as a content editor, I am happy to accept any and all essays, but I'm particularly interested in subjects that are not typically found in your traditional art history textbook. I want students to be exposed to those monuments and those sites and those objects that they would not find in museums or in a textbook. Um, so what you're finding here is pretty traditional, right? But I'm hoping to expand upon that. And so I'm happy to say that Smart History does offer some fellowships, not very many. And a few of those fellowships have gone to those uh, focused on Southeast Asia. And so within the next two years, um, the content should increase by at least 20 essays. Um, so I'm very happy that that is happening. And so one of our scholars working with us is Panga, who is currently um, working on his PhD at SOAS. And so I've encouraged him to really um, introduce you know, our global audience to monuments that uh, go beyond Borbador and uh, you know, Laura Jongrong, for example, and he's done just that. And then our second fellow, Maya, who is also a fellow at the Getty uh, Institute, um, works primarily in Cha material. So she is uh, populating our site with essays uh, that relate to uh, Cham art and also Vietnamese art in general as well. So I'm, I'm very excited for their work um, to be on smart history. Um, and, you know, smart history itself is really trying, so if you get a, if we look at this list, uh, trying to focus on building its content in areas of art that are traditionally marginalized. So you can see that their fellows tend to be in Southeast Asia, arts of the Caribbean, right? Um, First Nations, for example. Um, and so they're trying to build up that content. Okay. And this is to, I don't, combat is not the right word, but um, you know, if, if you look at the content that exists on smart history, right, it mirrors what you are going to find on college campuses, in bookstores, in museums, which means that it's heavily geared towards arts from the Western world, right? So uh, the content that you find on the Italian Renaissance, for example, in smart history, is incredibly rich and incredibly diverse. So you can see, for example, there are whole sections dedicated to Italian Renaissance of the early Renaissance, late Renaissance, and that there are whole sections dedicated to the Northern Renaissance as well. If you click on view all content, right, it will send you to 
a myriad of essays and videos as well. So there's just so much content as it relates to, for example, the Italian Renaissance that you just simply don't see, for example, in Southeast Asia or even um, on African art. And I think this very much mirrors what we see in academia as well, right? Who has the tenured positions? Which tenured positions continue to get filled? So when I'm thinking of Southeast Asia specifically and trying to reach out to my colleagues, you know, there is a certain privilege that one has to have in order to write for smart history, right? You have to have the privilege of having an outside income, right? You have to have the privilege of having the time. And so there are very few tenured faculty um, that cover the Southeast Asian region, whereas there are many tenured faculty that cover all aspects of Western art. Um, and, I, and I'm just thinking, you know, in the States, Robert Brown recently retired from UCLA. Uh, Patatorn Chiraprabhati recently left her position at Cal State. Um, and neither of those positions have been filled. And I don't see them being filled anytime soon. So those will just be holes in their departments without Southeast Asian specialists. Um, so the question might be, right, maybe, maybe not. How do I become a contributor or a contributor or institutional partner with Smart History? It's actually very easy. So you just contact your content or acquisitions editor. So whatever field of specialization you're in, you would contact that particular content editor and you would begin having a conversation, introducing yourself, um, what you're interested in writing on. And then from there, you're going to map out what their needs are and what your areas of specialization and interests are. For me, again, as the content specialist editor of Southeast Asia, I will take anything that you are interested in writing on as we build our content, right? That being said, as we continue to build, we're going to be more strategic as to how we organize the material. Um, and that's a conversation I would love to have with you if we have time, right? How should Southeast Asia be organized? Um, within Southeast Asia itself, because again, I think of smart history and reframing as a textbook within a textbook. When I talked to Tums and Hudson, I said, you know, look, you have virtually no Southeast Asia content in the survey. Are you going to produce a new Southeast Asia um, textbook? And she said, no. And I'm not surprised, right? If there are not professors teaching Southeast Asian art, then there are not students to buy those textbooks, right? So it's not a cost benefit for these publishers. So I really see smart history as a way to build the Southeast Asia textbook that I need and want for my students. Um, so what is the expectation for contributors? It's actually very easy. You know, we are accustomed to writing research articles, books, and essays that take years of our time, writing for smart history because the audience is so broad, because the content is meant to be highly digestible for this broad audience, which is primarily geared towards um, undergraduates. So, uh, you know, first, second, third year. However, that being said, all levels of students have access to this material. Object-based essays are between 800 to 1500 words, right? You could probably do that in like a few hours. Uh, monuments or site-based essays are 1800 to 2500 words. Thematic essays are 1500 to 2500 words. So it seems easy peasy, right? That's what I tell myself, just a few hours melody. But in actuality, it's hard to find those hours because you're a volunteer. So you're like everything else has precedence, right? My son has precedence. Uh, my teaching has precedence. Grading my students, sometimes wonderful, sometimes awful papers takes precedence. Um, but it's, if you are interested, it's not a cumbersome activity to undertake. And what I can say is that it's incredibly satisfying um, to have these essays on smart history, knowing that it's being accessed, knowing that it's being used and read by a broader audience beyond the five people who are interested in the minutia of the things that I do.
Okay. So how about institutions? Now, this is not the most up to date. Um, I know that there are actually more cultural institutions that are working with smart history that are not listed here, but you can just see um, this is actually a majority of the institutions that have partnered with smart history. Okay. And they partner in a different in a variety of ways. So I'm going to actually talk about two uh, two examples. I want to focus on the JP Getty Museum and the National Museum of Korea. So before I talk about those two examples, you, there are some folks here who might be wondering, well, how do I get my institution to partner with Smart History? Again, really easy uh, because it's very intimate because we are all what the same things, right? We all have a passion for art history. As an institution, you would simply email Beth or Stephen, and they are the nicest people you will meet. But before you do, I encourage you as an institution to, um, and again, different institutions function a little bit differently, but uh, you may want to talk to your education departments at your museum to map out what is a priority for your institution and how that content will live on smart history. Okay. And then from there, you will start the conversation with Beth and Steven. Um, so I just wanted to use these two examples because I think um, they're utilizing smart history in different but similar ways. Okay, so I want to focus first on the National Museum of Korea. Now, Korean art, at least in the United States, and its study is marginalized in comparison to the study of Chinese and Japanese art. There are very few specialists um, who teach Korean art, who are producing students with PhDs in Korean art in the US. And so the National Museum of Korea partnered with Smart History to make their content more well known to a global audience. Now the Korean government has been doing this in a variety of ways, right? They um, partner with museums all over the world, uh, but in working with Smart History, again, it is to make their collections more well known to a global audience. Well, Specialists and people living in Korea are very knowledgeable of, of the collections of the National Museum as one of the preeminent institutions of Korea. Um, other non-specialized groups are not. So to date, there are over 60 essays, a combination of essays and videos from the National Museum of Korea that lives on Smart History's website. So this content not only lives on Smart History, but if you go to one of these essays that live on smart history, as you see here, if you scroll down and finish the essay, you will see that the essay encourages you to link up. And even these live links will take you directly to the National Museum of Korea's website. So having people access material through smart history increases the foot traffic at the National uh, Museum of Korea, but it also directly links um, you back to this essay if you want for whatever reason to access it through the National Museum of Korea. So the exact same information also lives on the National Museum of Korea website. It's just presented differently because smart history has a particular aesthetic that they have. So um, again, right, this is very advantageous for the National Museum of Korea because it makes their collection more well known to a global audience. And what I can tell you, at least from my students, is that they don't know what museums have, right? They don't know which museum specializes in what content, um, but they know that smart history exists, right? So if they're looking for something that we've covered in class, they will just go to smart history, but they won't necessarily think, oh, I should go to the National Museum of Korea because we are looking at Korean objects in class, but they will go to smart history. Now, if we look at the J. Paul Getty Museums, right, this is a different type of institution that is partnering with uh, smart history. The J. Paul Getty Museums, as you know, is one of the wealthiest foundations in the world as it relates to art. They have a very significant global footprint. And so in this way, the content that is produced um, at the Getty with Smart History is not as robust as what we have seen with the National Museum of Korea, right? This makes sense because 
the, the Getty museums just don't need as much exposure, right? And so while the National Museum of Korea has produced over 60 essays to live on smart history in less than three years, right? The Getty has been one of the early partners of smart history, but has significantly less content. And the content that's produced um, is very much uh, through the efforts of individual curators, as you can see here, or staff members who are interested in having content live on smart history. Um, so this is less of an institutional buy-in, but more of an individual to individual buy-in um, with smart history. So you might be asking yourself, well, you know, yeah, it makes sense that the National Museum of Korea would be interested in working with smart history, but why would a place like the Getty be interested? Again, they're interested because of smart history's very broad and global reach. So for example, if we just look at smart Hi history's video content and their YouTube channel, you can see that smart history has roughly 290,000 subscribers, whereas the Getty has 130. 1,000 subscribers. Now, if we look at content that the Getty has produced that lives on both sites, right? So it lives on both Smart History and it lives on both the Getty, you will see that the same content uploaded at the same time, living on Smart History, it has 155,000 views, whereas living on the Getty, it has 4.5 thousand views, right? Again, Working with smart history really does expose your writing as graduate students or scholars wanting to work with smart history or your institutions to, uh, you know, an, um, to exponential growth. So, you know, everyone loves, uh, you know, impressionist art, right? Everyone loves Van Gogh, but, uh, you know, maybe this is just an outlier. So I wanted to look at another example. So here we have a video that was co-produced by the Getty and Smart History. So this video has only been up for two months. So again, the same content uploaded at the same time, living in two separate spaces on the Maya Codex, right? Living on Smart History, it's had three point, or it has 3,700 views, whereas living on the Getty, it has had 536 views. Okay. And I know this is not fair, but I thought, okay, well, how does this square with, uh, with the content here in, um, in Australia? And this isn't fair because one, the context of the material is different. The number of years that these videos have been up is different as well. But here you can see, I thought Matisse was a, a you know, an artist that we could work from because ever who doesn't love Matisse, right? Um, but here we have a video from the Art Gallery in New South Wales. It's been up for three years. It's had a lot of views, you guys, 14,000. That's nothing to sneeze at. But this, a video also uh, on Matisse that has been up uh, for double the time has had 70,000, 75,000 views, right? So again, I think the numbers are compelling, right? Beyond feeling good about um, writing for everyone, right? There are some numbers and statistics behind it. And so who uses smart history, right? At least 50 million people. I don't know who all those 50 million people are. Um, I know that at least one of them does and a handful of people here uses smart history. But what you can see here is that more than 600 universities, uh, K through 12, which is how we number our school districts in the US, uh, museums, libraries, and other learning institutions recommend smart history on their website. So what did I find? The Australian National University, right? Uh, I just, again, I just started from A to Z, you guys. So uh, here we are. So when you click on the national or the Australian National University link, it will take you to open access resources for our history where students will find smart history. So if they do not find it on their own, they may find it through their university or from their professors. Now, OER resources are really big in the US right now. For those of you who may not be familiar with it, OER are teaching, learning, and research resources that are free of cost and access barriers. And they also carry um, legal permissions for open use, right? So completely open access. And they can include full courses, 
like what you would find on the a Khan Academy, for example. They can include course materials, like what you would find on Smart History, modules, textbooks, streaming videos, even tests. Some offer software um, and any other tools and materials or techniques that can use to support education. This is a really big deal for us at my university in particular. Um, our university is trying to encourage faculty to assign more e OER resources to our students. So I personally have benefited financially um, in revamping my courses so that we move away from the traditional textbook to OER resources. Very recently, LMU was awarded um, $1.5 million from the US Department of Education to lead a three-year initiative to create open educational resources that can be used by anyone, right, once we produce the material. Um, what I can say is, uh, and this is somewhat um, anecdotally, but since my department transitioned many of our courses to OER, so not all of our courses has transitioned, but um, I would say half of them have in 2020, the number of our majors has doubled. Now that could be for a variety of reasons, right? It could be that students suddenly are very interested in art history, which is awesome. Um, it could be that we have removed those financial barriers. And what I can tell you from, again, this is very anecdotal, but in speaking to my students, oftentimes they'll say, art history is something that really interested me, but I, didn't want to take the classes because, you know, I have all these other classes that I need to take in my major. Um, I didn't want to buy a textbook that was $200 for something that was outside of my major. But because your class didn't have a textbook, um, I took your class and then I realized that art history was something that I really wanted to do. And so then they'll take on a double major or they'll switch over to art history as a major or as a minor. And so what I can tell you is that I've been in Sydney since July 26th. And since that time, um, I've been getting emails because as the chair, I have to approve all academic changes. So in the last, what is that, week and a half, I've had two students request to double major in art history and one student request to add it as a minor. And I really do believe, and again, I, this is anecdotal, but I do believe that removing those financial barriers has encouraged a different student body to take art history classes that might not have been interested in before. And then they realize that this is something that they really enjoy and that they don't actually want to go into business like their parents want them to, right? <laughs> or they don't actually want to be a bio major. Um, and so I've had a lot of students who are in the business school or, or, or doing biology who will add art history as a second major um, because it's just something that they find really interesting that they can't justify to their parents. What I've also found is that not only has the number of our students increased, but our students have also become much more diverse. Um, I'm not sure if this is true for art history here, but Traditionally at my university, and that could be because of my university in particular, but it, it tended to be um, very uh, like uh, Caucasian white. Um, and so now we have a much more diverse student body. So this is one of my classes. This is the, uh, we at my university, I'm very privileged that we do not enroll more than 19 students per class. And so this is my course on the history of museums where I only had 12 students. It was so nice. <laughs> uh, but you can see that, you know, the, my student body is very diverse. That being said, we do not have very many men who <laughs> major in art history. There's only one. But you can see that I have students of all cultures and backgrounds and demographics um, that are interested in art history. And um, I do attribute this in part to our concerted efforts to try to think about how we can not only present a more diverse art history in our curriculum, the type of classes that we teach, but also the types of materials that we assign um, to our students as well. So I thank you for your time.